Good morning, church. You know, it's a wonderful um, Sunday morning again. And uh, it's a, a great opportunity again to worship the Lord. And uh, do you want to go to that place where we will never grow old? <laughs> I want to go there. Never grow old. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Amen. Amen. Do you feel good? Do you feel good? Because I feel good. And there's a song, I feel good, good, good. Oh, I feel good. Oh, yes, my Lord. Because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that makes me feel good, 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 good. Amen. All right. <laughs> it's really a, uh, a wonderful day to worship the Lord. And every morning, it's a blessing. And uh, this morning, we're going to talk something really interesting. And um, for the past few weeks, we already, uh, we already talked about the uh, fruits of discipleship. But there is one more thing of um, utmost importance uh, that we need to discuss as we bear uh, fruits for the Lord. And uh, this one little word, this one little word is often overlooked. And this morning, we will look at this word as we conclude our vine and the branch lesson series. And our lesson title this morning will be True Discipleship, The Missing Link. All right. Now, let's go to John chapter 15, verse 8. It says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. The missing link is the word much. As you could see in uh, red mark, the word much. Now the original Greek translation and all major Bible translations, there is the word much. Okay? In verse 8 and I think in verse 6, if I'm not mistaken. But there is, in all those major translations in the Bible, including the Greek original text. There is the word much. Now, it made me think, why did Jesus say this word? Why did Jesus say this word much fruit? Okay. That you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciple. What is the significance of this word concerning bearing fruit? and concerning our Christian life. You know, Jesus' words tells us not only that we must bear fruits, but he explicitly said, bear much fruit. And uh, bearing much fruit, it does two things. Well, number one, the Father is glorified. Again, if we go to the verse, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And then the second one, we prove to be his disciples. Okay. Now, those are important things. In the Greek word, much is called polos, which means great in amount, many, emphasizes the quantity, okay. and also Qual uh, quality, an action, emotion with great intensity. So that is the meaning of the word much in its original Greek word. Now, before I go into the details of much, let us study the word much in God's perspective. All right? The much of God. 
In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our trespasses. It is by grace you have been saved. Now, the word polos is used in this particular word, great. So, much and great, as used in this particular verse, the word polos is used. Okay? It means the great emotion. It means the great affection of God for all of us manifested by his action. So remember the meaning of Paulus a while ago. Great affection, emotion, in action. So the, the action by God was by sending his only son to die for us. And doing so, offering Jesus Christ and make us alive in Christ even when we are dead in our trespasses. Now, let's see the following scriptures regarding the idea of polos or the idea of much or great of an action from God. Now, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, But God proves, proves his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave up for, for us all, how will he not also, along with him, freely give us all things? Romans 8, 32. Now in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Now, I want to put that up, those three scriptures in one slide, so you could see them side by side, or you could see them all at once, in one time. All right. Now, these three scriptures, along with uh, many others like them, okay, it describes that God gave his all to all of us. God gave his all to all of us. He gave not only his best, he gave his very best to us. Now look at uh, Romans chapter 5 verse 8. Let us first look at Romans chapter 5 verse 8. Now, the very start of the sentence, looking at this, for me it's so, it's so touching. It's so moving for me. Why? Because it says, but God proves. But God proves his love for us in this. Did you hear that? Everybody, did you hear the word proves? But God proves okay, his love for us in this. Now, I will have to throw this out. To all of us, God does not, he doesn't need to prove himself to all of us. God doesn't need to prove himself to me. God doesn't need to prove himself to you. Why? Who am I? Who am I in front of a living God? Who are we in front of a living God? We are nothing compared to him. I am nothing in front of a living God. But why does God need to prove himself to me? Okay? Now, the word alone, that action of God, the word prove, is telling us the greatness of his love. You see? Again, why does God need to prove himself to all of us? He is God. I am not. We are not. We are just his creation. But God said, God proved his love for us. He doesn't need to explain himself to all of us. He doesn't need to prove himself to any of us. But he did. He did. And that tells me his great 
affection to all of us. So I hope we can all see that great love of God to you. Now, another question is, how did God prove his love for us? Now, by sending his only son. Another question is, why his only son? Have you ever imagined, or have you ever have that question in your mind, why did God have to send, to send his son to die for me? Why not somebody else? Why not my neighbor? <laughs> Why his only son? Why not an animal? Why not a bird? Why not something or from his creation? Why his only son? The question is, or the answer is, 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or spot. What does that mean? A lamb without blemish or any spot. Meaning, perfect. Perfect. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. Jesus was the best sacrifice. Jesus was the very best sacrifice that God could send to appease himself so that our sins may be forgiven. He sent his very best for you and I. That's why he sent his son, his only begotten son to die for you and I. But again, he didn't have to do that. He is God. But he did. But he did. He sent the very best. And Jesus didn't also need to die. But he did. Why? Because of their great love for all of us. And that is love not only in words, but love in action. Now, the second part of the scripture in Romans 8.32, those who say that they are not blessed by God should be, it must be, must be taught by this. If we say that we are not blessed with God, let us read this over and over again. See, since God didn't spare his only son, how will he not also give us everything? Even his only son, he didn't hold back. Why didn't he give us everything? In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, tells us that everything we need for in this life, and of course in godliness, God had given us everything. He did not hold back. He holds nothing back for himself. He gave it all. He gave it all for our benefit and for whatever uh, needs there is for us. It's all here. It's all here. That's why we should never say that God, you know, he, he, he chose to bless those other people. He's not blessing me. No, don't ever say that. Because every morning is a blessing. Every time you open your eyes, it's a blessing from God. And read Romans 8.32 and 2 Peter 1.3. We are blessed beyond measure. Amen to that. See? Now, with all that said, that is the much of God. The very best of God. And he didn't only give us the good. He didn't only give us his better. He gave us his best. He gave his very best. No holding back. No holding back. Now, let us see the word much in history. 
in Genesis chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Now, we have here the story of the first act of worship in history, as recorded in the Bible. And as we can see, Abel's offering was accepted by God because it was what? It was the best. For the scripture, while Cain's offering was not accepted. Now, the Lord asked Cain in verse 6 and verse 7 of Genesis chapter 4, the Lord said, why are you angry? Why are you so angry? Why are you down, you know, casted? Why do you look so dejected? You know, if, if you do what is right, you will be accepted. And the Lord said, you know, watch out. Because sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it. You must subdue it and be its master. Now, without a doubt, God revealed to both of them how he wants to be worshipped. They knew how God wants them to worship him, or to, worship, yeah, to worship him. God told Cain and Abel specifically. And God told Cain, if you do what is right and do what I told you to do, you will be accepted. But Cain didn't. It implies that Cain knew what to do because God told him to do so. Unfortunately, you know, he didn't do it. He didn't do it. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, talking about the offering of Cain and Abel. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice or a more excellent sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commanded as righteous when God gave approval to his gifts. And by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. Now, let us look at the word better in the original Greek word. It is pleion. More excellent, very great, many, higher in value, higher in quality, comparative of holos. So much and better are similar. Similar in the Bible. All right? Now, Cain's offering wasn't accepted by God because he didn't give the best to God. His very best to God. He knew what would please God and it is within his ability, within his means to do so. But he didn't do it. All right? He held back. Now, maybe, just maybe, maybe Cain gave his best crop, you know, to God. But not with the best attitude. Maybe he was grumbling inside. Not with the best of heart. Not sincere. Or maybe, just maybe, Cain didn't give the best crop to God. And he reserved the best for himself. Now remember, the word much and the word better means larger in, in quantity, better in quality, or great in action. Okay? Our attitude. So one of those things, Cain failed. He failed. All right? Now, do you remember the, the widow's might? In the, the story in the Bible, the widow's might. What she gave was so small so small in amount okay, the last the last penny i would say in her pocket compared to those other people going inside the temple giving more than she was giving but jesus praises her 
than all of the other people that's giving more than she was giving. Jesus praises her because she's giving her all. She's giving her very best to God. And she, she, she held nothing back for, himself, or for herself. Everything to the Lord. Now, we are familiar with the definition of sin in James chapter 4, verse 17. The definition according to James, anyone then who knows the right thing to do, yet fails to do, fails to do it, is guilty of what? Guilty of sin. Now Cain, he was guilty of this. He was guilty of this. He knew the right thing to do, but he didn't do it. He didn't do it. There was guilt in Cain's heart. His conscience was torturing him. You know why I know that? Because he killed his brother. Cain killed his brother. He cannot bear the guilt, the conscience in him. If he did the right thing, and if for conscience sake, if there was no guilt in him, he could just brush it off. But no, he didn't. He was so guilt-stricken, his conscience unbearable, he killed his brother Abel. And James chapter 14, uh, chapter 4, verse 17, also talks about our guilt. It talks about our conscience. And it talks about our much. Our much for God. Why? Because knowing we could do more for God, but we held back and said, do more for ourselves. That is the sin according to James chapter 4, verse 17. And that is commonly, commonly called as the guilt or the sin of omission. Knowing the right thing and doing it not is a sin. Now in Luke chapter 10, you are familiar with Luke chapter 10, verses 30 and the following verses, the parable of, of uh, the Good Samaritan. Okay. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, a certain man was traveling and he, and he was attacked and he was robbed. And he was left half dead on the street. And then there were three passersby, a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. Okay. The priest and the Levite saw the man, but they didn't do anything. They just continued walking as if they saw nothing or saw no one. The Samaritan, when he saw the man, he helped the man. Now remember, in the Bible, the Samaritan and the Jews, they never see eye to eye. Okay? But regardless, what the Samaritan saw was not a race. What he saw was not a Jew or a Gentile or whoever that person was. What he saw was a person in need. A human being in need. And he did the right thing. He helped, he cared, and he had compassion on that poor man left by the robbers half dead on the road. You see, the priest and the Levite, they were a pious man. They were pious men, right? And they could have been fruitful in their own work for the Lord, all right? They could have been fruitful. They were pious men. But during the time, they didn't do anything to the man to show their piety. No. They just walked past by the man. The word much was lacking to those two persons. The word much was lacking to the priest and to the Levite. But not to the good 
Samaritan. Now the question is, how are we supposed to do the much that we are talking about? In Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, Whatever you might do, work from the soul as to the Lord and not to men. The word work from the soul, it means your whole being in other translation. It means from the heart. This means whatever we do, including that of our service to God, put and give your very best. Okay. Put in your, your, your whole heart, your whole being, your whole mind, your strength, your soul, in your service to God. Never hold back. If it is within your means, within your ability, within your power to do so. Part of the scripture reading a while ago, thank you, Brother Alex, for reading our scripture. In Luke chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. The question is, how do we do or how do we love the Lord? How do we love God according to this text? If we will understand the meaning of this particular command by Jesus Christ, you will unlock the real meaning of the word much that Jesus told us in John chapter 15, verse 8. Now let us look at some of the, uh, the definition of the word love. The Lord said, Jesus said, love the Lord. In the Hebrew language, the word love is called ahab, or ahab, which describes a variety of close emotional bonds like love uh, a, a father to a son, like that of a friend to a friend. And it can also be in a romantic manner, like a husband and wife. So that's the, the Hebrew word for love, ahab. Now, because of the strong emotional attachment, there is this desire you know, to be in the presence of the object of your love. You want to be always there in the object of your love so that both of you can feel both of your presence, right? Now, another Hebrew word for love, which according to some of the, the readings I've, I've read, is hard to explain, but it can be explained, is the word hesed. Another Hebrew for the word love, hesed. Hesed is not a romantic, infatuation kind of love. It is a faithful, reliable love. It is loyal. It is love put to action. Love in action. It intervenes on behalf of loved ones and comes to their rescue. Now, has said it encompasses the whole attributes of God. All right? For God is love. And God is love. Now, when we talk of the love of God, now let us think of pizza. Okay. Now, probably later I'll get a pizza. So let's, let's think of pizza when we talk of the word, the love of God. Okay. On that pizza, you know, you have mozzarella cheese, you have uh, different herbs, different spices, tomatoes, black olives, like pepperoni, you know, and, and, and all other meats. Okay. There's in, in that pizza. Now, when we talk of God's love, in that God's love, when you talk about that, 
you will have, you will taste God's loving kindness, God's faithfulness. You will be talking about grace. You will be talking about loyalty. You will be talking about uh, forgiveness. And the list goes on and on. That is the word has said. It encompasses all the attributes of God when you talk about God. And when you talk about love, there is everything inside that love like that pizza. You have all those tappings on that pizza. Now, the word has said, it is not just an affection. No, it is not just an emotion. No, it is affection or love in action. All right. Now, the best example of has said is John 3.16. John 3.16, when God sent his only begotten son to this world to die for our sins. That is love in action. That is hesed. All right. Now, the problem with love being an emotion or the word ahab, because in that term, love is an emotion. Love is a feeling. Love is an affection. There can be a loophole in that kind of love. And when we engage in that kind of love, because a psalm would just simply view it as a feeling. Some would try to view it just an affection. And if we do that, we reduce the meaning of love into the context of what I would call circumstantial love. A circumstantial kind of love. It weakens love to a circumstantial kind of love. Now, for example, I love you because you are generous to me. Okay? I would give to you because you are so giving to me. But when that generosity subsides, my feelings will also subside. So therefore, the affection, therefore the love is based on circumstances. Are you following? Okay. But not hesed. This is where hesed comes in. And it strengthens that love. It, stre it strengthens that love, the meaning of love. Regardless of the situation, Regardless of the event, regardless of the circumstances, I love you because I love you. I love you because that's the right thing to do. I love you because God told me so. And that is what said means. It is more than feelings. It is more than affections. It embodies mercy. It embodies grace. It embodies generosity. It embodies forgiveness. It embodies loyalty. Love in action. Now in Luke chapter 6, you will have the typical kind or typical type of circumstantial love. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. The word much. See? Even sinners are giving their best in loving their own kind. Now the Lord told us, Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Heart, the chief organ of physical life, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Le Leviticus 17.11 It occupies the most important place in the human system. By an easy transition, the word came to stand for a man's entire mental and moral activity, both the rational and the emotional elements. In other words, the heart is used figuratively for the hidden springs of the personal life. So, when Jesus said, love the Lord with all your heart, the heart encompasses our affections, our emotions, our desires, our passions, and it also our reasoning when it comes to feelings. 
And Jesus said, with your soul and with all mine. Soul denotes the breath, the breath of life. The breath of life with, which God breathed into man to make him a living being, the natural life of the body. Mind, it denotes speaking generally the seat of reflective consciousness comprising the faculties of perception and understanding and those of feeling, judging, and determining. You see, the heart, the soul, and the mind, it represents the unseen part of man. You cannot see that. So it represents the unseen part of man. Our mind is the seat of our intellect, the seat of your understanding and reasoning. And it enables us to think it enables us to analyze, to reason, and to imagine. And Jesus said, with all our strength, the strength, the ability, the power, and might we exert in loving God and others. Given, given all these facts, it means we are not just to love God with only part of ourselves. Not just one, one half of yourself or one part of yourself, but to love Him with the whole of yourself. That is the whole essence. When Jesus said, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Our whole being, it represents our heart. It is our affection that we have for God. We must, that, we must have that affection towards God as deep as we would to our fellow. If you so love your fellow, you should love even more God. Because God has given everything to you. He giving, a given, gave His best for you. Soul, it says, as the length of our life. How do we love God with our soul? It is the bread of life, the length of our life. You know, loving God, it is not just for the time being. Loving God, it is not just for today. Loving God is not just for tomorrow or for the next day. Loving God is for the entirety of your life. That's why it is the breath of life. It is until the end of the breath of life God gave each and every one of us. Mind. How do we love God with our mind? Our mind is our intellect. It must belong to God. Our inspirations, our aspirations. Inspirations means what motivates us every day to keep going must be God. Our aspirations, what does it mean? It means our goals, our purpose in life. Our hope must be founded on God and on God alone. And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with your strength. Our strength, our abilities and might should be exerted towards what glorifies God. Your talents, all your talents, all our efforts, it must not be wasted on things that God hates, but rather on things that will advance the kingdom of God. By understanding all of this, my dear brethren and friends, on how we must love God, we are therefore, I would say, not shortchanging God. If God gave us His very best for all of us, I believe that we too must give our very best to Him. We must give all that we have for God. Don't hold back. Give your whole being to God. Because our life is the very best sacrifice to God. Now the same appeal of Apostle Paul that he did to the brethren in Romans will be the same appeal that I will do to all of us. In Romans chapter 12 verse 1, on account of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. 
Now, a disciple, a disciple is capable of loving those who love them. But what separates a disciple from a real disciple, the real disciple, he has the ability to love the unlovable. Now the Lord told us, if someone asks you to carry his load for him one mile, carry it for him two miles. And remember, what differentiates an ordinary man from an extraordinary man? The word extra. The word extra. Because the word extra is his very best. That is his much. But the missing link to real discipleship is the word much. Jesus again told us empathically what glorifies God the Father is that we bear much fruit. My character may have been changed and I may be witnessing for Jesus, but if I am not giving my all, my best, my very best to Jesus, then I would say I am shortchanging God. If I know what I ought to do for God and didn't do it, James 4.17, I am guilty of sin. Now remember, remember Abel's offering. It was accepted by God. Why? Because it was the best. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 it tells us whatever your hand finds to do, do it mightily. Why? Because in the afterlife, you cannot do anything. It means while we are here, give your very best, especially in serving the Lord. Give all that you have. Give it all you've got for God. Because in the afterlife, you cannot do that anymore. That is why the wisest of all tells us, whatever your fine hands to do, do it with all your might. Now finally, brethren, friends, I will leave you with this poem that I made. God gave his best so I can have the best. God gave his best. Am I giving my best? And if I am not, then why not? God gave the best, his only son. This he did so I can have my freedom. If my best is still not, then why not? Why am I holding back? Does he not deserve all my love? If my best I refuse, will it be his loss or my loss? If thoroughly I think, maybe the reality would sink. God gave his best. I too must give my best. For I know I am blessed only by the best. The gospel is yours, my dear friends and brethren. If anybody here who have not yet accepted the Lord, we encourage you. Come. To the, to the fall of God. Come to Jesus. Be reconciled with him. Repent of your sins. Wash away your sins. And be forgiven. And have that wonderful place in heaven someday. The invitation is yours. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation?